Okay, hi everyone. Um, so, my name is Sergey. I'm a PhD student at the University of Luxembourg, and I would like to present to you our work with Professor Alex Durkov on the dynamization and linkability of cryptocurrency transactions based on network analysis. So, it's, it's, it's nice to present in front of the audience for whom crypto still means cryptography. But our, our talk is about other crypto. So, I will describe briefly uh, how networking properties of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies work. Then I will describe our novel transaction clustering method, which lets an adversary uh, identify which transaction actually originated from the same cryptocurrency user. Then I will show you some experimental results which confirm that our method does indeed work, and some discussion will follow. So uh, Bitcoin, I'm sure many of you know what it is, but I will just mention that it is the first digital cryptocurrency to solve the double spending problem using proof of work. And for our purposes, uh, it's important to understand that the centers um, of, uh, of Bitcoin transactions broadcast the transactions to a peer-to-peer -peer network, they get propagated to the peer-to-peer -peer network, then miners uh, pick them up and construct blocks out of those transactions and confirm them. So this is the general mechanics. And privacy in Bitcoin is kind of tricky because on the one hand, uh, at the protocol level, no, uh, the addresses are not linked to any real-world identity, and users have some sense of privacy, and they can generate as many key pairs, as many addresses as, as they wish, and it's actually advised to do so, but the sense of privacy um, can be a false sense of privacy, because the blockchain, which stores all transactions from the very beginning of the system, is public knowledge. Anyone can download it, analyze it, and apply certain heuristics to understand who was behind certain transactions. So uh, this is how a typical Bitcoin transaction looks like. It consumes a number of inputs and produces a number of outputs, which will be inputs for next transactions. And uh, one very simple heuristic is that all inputs probably belong to the same person or the same entity, the sender. Of course, this is not true in all the cases because there are such things as uh, multi-signature transactions, but in many cases this is true. Another heuristic is that one of the outputs probably also belongs to the sender because uh, this is the so-called change address. And by using such heuristics, um, an adversary can identify quite a lot of information, also can leverage public knowledge about which addresses belong to, say, known exchanges or known big, I don't know, service providers or something like that. So this is a popular, uh, uh, popular uh, vector of anonymization, and there are multiple papers written about that. Uh, and, of course, uh, people, developers of cryptocurrencies are trying to uh, combat this trend, and there are multiple uh, alternative cryptocurrencies which uh, emphasize Privacy uh, preserving properties and the three major one of uh, the three major privacy focused coins uh, in uh, alphabetical order here are Dash, Monero, and Zcash. Dash uses missing by a network of so-called master nodes. Monero uses uh, real signatures and Zcash uses zero knowledge proofs and more precisely Zcash nodes to hide transaction details and still um, allow anyone to validate that everything is uh, going according to the rules. And these um, techniques they. Uh, do in fact make blockchain analysis, which I described earlier, more difficult. But in this work, we are interested in another aspect, namely the network analysis. So we're interested in the questions such as how do transactions propagate to the network, and what information does the well network adversary um, can extract from those transactions, and more precisely, is it possible to understand whether two transactions were actually um, uh, signed and broadcast by the same user or not? So, uh, our two uh, contributions in this work are as follows. First, we introduce a new transaction clustering method uh, based on IP addresses and weighting the IP addresses that first propagate a certain transaction, and I will explain in more detail how we do that. And then we validate our method um, experimentally, uh, doing experiments not only on Bitcoin, both on testnet and mainnet, but also on the three uh, alternative cryptocurrencies that I mentioned earlier, and uh, as far as we're aware, where the first um, to, um, to apply these techniques not only to Bitcoin, but also to other cryptocurrencies. So, now we'll describe how we actually do the transaction clustering. So, um, a brief, uh, brief background, how message propagation works in Bitcoin. So, uh, if, um, say, Alice is on the left and Bob is on the right, if Alice knows about a new transaction with a certain hash, she um, first announces this hash in an inventory message to Bob. And then, only if Bob is interested in this uh, transaction, he replies with a get data message, and then Alice um, replies with a TX message for a transaction or a block message for a block. So the, the blocks and transactions are not just pushed 
But uh, the user who is interested in getting the full data must query the data from, from a neighboring node. And uh, of course, uh, if such a uh, gossiping mechanism would be implemented just uh, naively, uh, it would be dangerous for privacy because an adversary could listen to the network and try to estimate who, or where is the center, where is the source of the rumor. That's why there are certain what we call broadcast randomization techniques used in Bitcoin and in other cryptocurrencies. So we identified two such techniques and they are called trickling and diffusion. Trickling was used in Bitcoin before 2015 and is still used in Zcash which is based on uh, a fork of Bitcoin core code base. So in Shipping, instead of um, announcing a new transaction to all the neighbors, um, a node chooses a random subset of the neighbors and announces the transaction to them. Then, after a certain uh, timeout, uh, 100 milliseconds, another random subset is chosen and the transaction is announced to another random subset of neighbors. So uh, this is one method. And another method is called diffusion. It is used, uh, used currently in Bitcoin. Uh, then, um, uh, in diffusion, for each neighbor, a node generates a random delay and announces a transaction to the neighbor after that random delay. So, uh, this is how uh, cryptocurrency developers are trying to um, make networking analysis more difficult, but as we will show, this is not uh, completely uh, successful. So, this is the general intuition behind our method. Um, we assume that transactions which were issued from the same node have uh, correlated broadcast patterns. So uh, by listening to the network, we will be able to understand for pairs of transactions uh, how likely are they, uh, are they to uh, have originated from the same node. So now I will explain step by step how we actually achieve uh, this goal. So first of all, we establish many parallel connections to many nodes. So we want to, um, uh, to get as well um, as good view of the network as possible, and then we log the traffic, namely the timestamps of the transaction announcements in, in the Tor messages. Then for each transaction, we consider uh, the first few IP addresses which announced it to us. So um, in, in addition to previous uh, related work, which uh, considered only the first IP truly in transaction, we consider multiple IP addresses, and we um, assign weights to these IP addresses uh, to better uh, describe this real-world relationship. Then we um, apply clustering method and we cluster transactions which have um, similar or close IP vectors and then we measure the decrease in anonymity which uh, results from this, from this clustering. So um, how do we establish parallel connections? First of all, why do we even need to establish many connections to one node? Uh, Bitcoin nodes by default maintain 8 outgoing connections and can accept up to 117 incoming connections. Of course, only if the uh, corresponding port is open. Um, of course, this configuration file can be, can be changed. By the, but the point is that if we connect with the reference software with only one connection, then the probability that we will be the first one to receive a new transaction announcement will be very low. So some remote node will get a new transaction and will choose some random node among, among maybe 20 or maybe even 100 connections. We will be probably not among the... Uh, not, we will not be this first node. So to... Um, to make us more likely to be the first to receive a new transaction, we establish many parallel connections uh, for each node. So uh, this is uh, not, this of course not implemented in reference software because this is not kind of something that a usual node would want to do. That's why we use uh, PC Client, which is um, uh, a piece of software developed in our lab previously while working on another paper nearly five years ago about Bitcoin. And PC Client implements uh, Bitcoin networking functionality and lets us connect with many parallel connections to um, the same node. And we use it for experiments on Bitcoin and on, on Zcash as well, because Zcash um, uh, inherits most of the networking stack of Bitcoin. And um, kind of a side note I will show on the next slides, that we also study the distribution of the number of free uh, connection slots in Bitcoin and Zcash, and show that they uh, are pretty similar in that regard. So uh, on, this, uh, on this chart, on this histogram, on the x-axis we have the uh, number of open connection slots that we were able to occupy, and on the y-axis the percentage of uh, nodes with that number of free connection slots. So we see here, interestingly enough, uh, in the beginning we see this big peak, and that probably means, we're not completely sure, but we think that might mean that some firewall rules uh, have, a, uh, have a role here, because we are not trying to hide our IP, we're just connecting from the same IP again and again, and maybe some servers have uh, automated limits on how many connections um, can we establish from one IP address. Then we have uh, a peak around maybe 100, which suggests that um, 
many nodes are running with 10 to 20 uh, to maybe 30 connections, and then we have this big peak on 125, which is the biggest number of connections that we even tried to establish. And this is just the compressed long tail of very, very highly connected nodes. And we checked some of them manually and figured out that some of them allow up to, uh, I think, 400 connections or even more. So these are the nodes with modified configurations. And Zcash shows a very similar picture. So uh, going back to our clustering uh, technique, the key point that we use to analyze transaction timings is waiting. Uh, so we assign weights to IP addresses. So if a certain transaction was announced to us by a number of IP addresses, we take the first uh, few of them and assign weights to them according to this formula. So we try multiple function families and we came to the conclusion that this one gives the best results. And we uh, parameterize this function with a parameter k and parameter k is chosen for each transaction individually. So um, in real networks, some transactions get to us very quickly, some get to us a little bit slower, and we want to uh, maintain, in, for every transaction, maintain the following property, that this weight of IP addresses, it neither drops too, too quickly, nor it drops too slowly, but it shows that the first IP address is the most significant one, is the most likely to be close to the original sender, the second one is a little bit less likely, and so on and so on. So uh, here, uh, I've just shown the example of how this function behaves on three vectors of timestamps. This is artificial data, just, just for, the sake of, for the sake of example. So um, if the timestamps are, are very close, if the timestamps are evenly distributed in a certain range, if the timestamps are um, after the first propagation, we have this um, pause and then multiple propagations follow um, here. So in any case, we have this uh, relative importance of IP reflected in this way. So we have multiple transactions. For each transaction we have this um, weighted uh, IP addresses. Uh, what do we do next? Next we create a correlation matrix. So for each pair of uh, these weight vectors we calculate the correlation coefficient and we put these coefficients into a matrix. And our hypothesis is if, uh, if the transactions which were um, issued by the same node are really correlated we would expect that this matrix would have a special structure. Namely that with uh, uh, with the right permutation of rows and columns, we would be able to find uh, such a permutation that clusters would be visible along the main diagonal. That will mean that some subsets of transactions will be closely related to each other than to some other random transactions, which will correspond to the nodes which, issues, uh, which issue these transactions. So we visualize the correlation uh, matrices as heat maps, and I will just uh, quick uh, a couple of quick points which will help you understand the pictures that I will show next. So uh, darker color means high correlation, and the matrix is also symmetric by definition because uh, correlation is symmetric. And the main diagonal is the correlation of transaction with itself, and that's why it's black, meaning one by definition. Um, so yeah, and the next point is how do we measure the effect of our attack, how do we measure anonymity. So we use the anonymity measure, anonymity degree proposed by Diaz uh, and Quarters. In 2002, so this actually measures, uh, um, this was introduced as far as, uh, as I remember for messaging systems, and it measures the amount of information that the attacker can get um, regarding who uh, were the authors of each messages. And it varies from 0 to 1, where uh, 1 is perfect anonymity, meaning that uh, from the attacker's point of view, each, uh, for each message, each user is equally likely to have been the author of this message. And D equals zero, meaning not an image at all, meaning the attacker knows the senders of all the messages. So we are trying to, uh, so from the point of view of the attacker, we are trying to get uh, as um, uh, close to zero as possible. So putting the pieces together, what do we actually do? Uh, practically, we connect to many nodes. Uh, we actually use uh, three servers on three uh, different continents, Europe, Asia, and uh, America, to get the better view of the network. We log the, the transaction announcements and we assign weights to vectors of timestamps um, for each IP address that relate a certain transaction to us. Then we calculate the pairwise correlations between uh, these weight vectors, and we apply this special co-clustering algorithm, which is um, a method which does exactly what we need. It tries to find the, the permutation of rows and columns in a matrix, such that the internal clustering structure will be visible, and it is even implemented in a popular uh, Python SQLM library. Then we calculate the anonymity degree using our own transactions as ground truth. 
And uh, basically that's it. And I should also mention that uh, we also take uh, ethical uh, consideration into account. We experiment with our own transactions, and we do make most experiments on the testnet. So these are the experimental results. So this is probably the most uh, clear picture that we uh, that we obtained. This is the Bitcoin testnet, and on Bitcoin testnet we uh, did the full scale experiment, connecting to all nodes with as many connections as possible. And we clearly see that uh, here the black lines indicate our old transactions from the control set, and we see that they actually form a cluster. And we even see some other clusters also forming along the main diagonal. So uh, we also did the experiment on the Bitcoin mainnet, but in order not to disrupt the actual network, we limited ourselves and we only connected to 1,000 nodes, which is about one tenth of the nodes available, and didn't try to occupy all connection slots. That's why the results are significantly worse. Now our, connection, our transactions are scattered around the clusters, though some of them form some kind of groups over here. But we see the structure, some squares actually along the main diagonal also form as expected. We also did an experiment on Zcash, and there the picture is not that clear, but still our transaction form a cluster here and kind of a cluster over there. And it's also important to note that in Zcash transactions can be, uh, can be shielded or transparent, and only shielded transactions take advantage of the um, sophisticated cryptography of ZK snarks. Here the longer black lines indicate shielded transactions and shorter indicate transparent transactions, which shows that uh, our method doesn't care um, whether we use uh, ZK snarks or not, because we only, um, we only take hashes into account. We also did an experiment on Monero and Dash, but without our own transactions. We only uh, captured some traffic and tried to apply the same clustering algorithm to see whether it exhibits the same uh, block diagonal structure, and we see that it actually, uh, that actually does, at least to some extent. And with, with Dash, we also see uh, a similar picture. So uh, another uh, kind of side note, we also tried to es estimate the original IP address for the cluster, and it's uh, only possible in certain circumstances. So if a node connects to a network, it advertises its IP address in an address message. So if our listener nodes are online and are recording this traffic, they can, um, uh, they can compare the IP address announced in the, in the address message with the IP addresses which are uh, highly ranked in certain clusters. So uh, we obtain, uh, we show that at least on the Bitcoin testnet, an adversary can narrow down the search of the source IP address to uh, about five IP addresses. So what does it actually cost? We estimated very, very roughly the cost of our attack, and we came to the conclusion that for the full-scale attack on the Bitcoin mainnet, it would cost uh, on the order of hundreds of US dollars. So we spent on the order of tens of US dollars for AWS servers. So it's uh, feasible for a moderately resourceful attack. And what about countermeasures? Uh, from a cryptocurrency user point of view, we think that you shouldn't uh, issue many transactions during the same session. And if you do, you may want to run your nodes with an increased number of connections and also periodically drop and reestablish connections or uh, maybe uh, implement stronger broadcast standardization. This is more for cryptocurrency developers. And I should also mention two recent developments in Bitcoin. Uh, in Bitcoin. So there is Dandelion and Dandelion++. Plus Plus. Uh, this is a proposal for two-stage propagation for better anonymity. And there is a very recent proposal called ULA, proposed just uh, last month. And both of them um, uh, modify the broadcast relay mechanism. And uh, this would defeat our attack, because in this proposal, the nodes distinguish between outgoing and incoming connections. And because it's hard to force a node to connect to us, uh, that will defeat our attack. So basically, in conclusion, we see that the, the timing announcements actually reveal information on the related transactions, and the randomization techniques are not very efficient as they are today, and our clustering method works uh, better on small networks like Bitcoin testnet, works a bit worse on big networks like Bitcoin mainnet. The future work, mobile wallets, we're trying to investigate whether our technique also applies to transactions issued from smartphones. And basically, that's it. So this is the website of our lab. We're hiring podcasts on my personal website. Thank you. Time for some questions. Yes. Hi. What happens for uh, about the transaction already stored in the blockchain? Because it means that this method works for the for only the transactions that need to be stored, that need to be mined. But for the old transactions, what? Uh, are you able to de-anonymize them? 
Now, our method only works if we capture the traffic in real time. So it's, uh, if we don't capture a transaction, then we can do, can do anything. More questions? There's one over there. Really in the middle. <laughs> Let me check if there's somebody else who want to make a question, so we have the second mic moving. Um, you said that for Zcash, the picture is not so clear. However, um, the secret network is around 350 nodes, roughly, while Bitcoin is around 10,000. So why is Zcash, in your analysis, let's call it worse than Bitcoin? I don't. Uh, so uh, we also um, didn't want to disrupt the Zcash mainnet. It's maybe one one reason. Another reason may be that uh, testnet may um, Bitcoin testnet may not show the same properties as the actual mainnet because people are experimenting on testnet and it's more likely that some developer is issuing like 100 transactions at one time on testnet but not on the mainnet. So it's a little bit different properties. Okay, but Zcash uh, is still using Trickling, which is supposed to be worse than the newer uh, diffusion protocol. Uh, maybe uh, Trickling is not so good for your analysis, or could that also be an effector? Uh, yeah, that, that may be the case. Another another paper referenced in the related work section suggests that actually switching from Trickling to diffusion didn't change that much. So it's it, it, it was not much of an improvement actually. Thank you. So. Uh, you start uh, I was wondering if um, mixers, current mixers, have some fingerprint <coughs> on whether this um, can somehow bias your results or some of these clusters could belong to some of the uh, mixers or something like that. Have you think about that? Uh, so can you repeat the mixers? Can they do what? Yeah, if, if, uh, given that many mixers do this, um, have these frequent patterns of uh, doing the transactions, because you say that they I hypothesis that the user has kind of similar product uh, patterns. Uh, could be that uh, also the case of uh, mixers doing several transactions uh, like in a similar pattern or something like that? Yeah, I mean, we, we didn't uh, really look into mixers specifically, but uh, if, if a mixer is popular and actually does multiple transactions per, I don't know, per minute, then it may be visible as a cluster in our analysis, but we didn't uh, try to look into it specifically. One more last question. Go ahead. Um, so you didn't mention that uh, usually when you try to send an anonymous transaction, you can use Tor for that. So Bitcoin Core supports the ability to use the, a hidden service or also like the normal Tor network. Um, did you uh, think about like as a mitigation for uh, anonymous transaction? Oh, no, we didn't look uh, into it specifically, maybe this can be a direction for future work, but uh, some previous work uh, also from, from our lab, this is a paper called uh, Bitcoin over Tor is not a good idea, uh, which suggests that Bitcoin and Tor don't mix together very well, at least at that time. Uh, so, um, we'll see, I don't have a clear answer. Okay, so let's thank the speaker again.